Did you hear your intro song? Yeah, I love it. <laughs> there you are. What's up? I, I figured it was good because um I'm in the video, so it, it made sense. Yeah, right? <laughs> That's right. I remember when I hit you back. That is so funny. I think I hit you but, up. Uh, oh, you need people to be in a Bukhun 82 video? I'm your girl. Yeah, thanks for that intro, by the way. For uh, oh, Of course. Yeah. What's How up? How you doing? How's 2021 treating you post-pandemic life? You know, it's so, so, so far so good. Just, you know, trying to get my, my footing like everyone else. But it seems like things are hopefully clearing up a little bit. And hopefully everyone's going back to work. So what about you? Um, yeah, you know, trying to do the same. Trying, trying to follow in the Sandler footsteps, I feel. <laughs> do you hear? Here. Um, oh, sweet. Is it your birthday this week? It is my birthday this week. Oh, happy birthday. What day? The 28th on Thursday. Thursday, 28th. That's amazing. Wait, so what sign does that make you? Aquarius. Aquarius. Amazing. What are you? Happy birthday. I'm a Libra. A Libra. Oh, that makes yeah. Sense. I'm like, and I have all the Libra traits. It's crazy. Do you know you're rising in your moon? Uh, damn, I can't remember off the top right now. I do like, I do readings once a year. Oh, okay. Yeah. I yeah. Like you're low key, very spiritual. People don't really Yeah. Know. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely try to be definitely more so in the last like two years, definitely the last year I've tried to be more about it and find my inner, inner peace and all that fun stuff. That's really important. Inner peace is, is outer, <laughs> outer knowledge. I feel like outer knowing yeah. very to have that inner peace. So, um, when you when you became like more in tune with those things did it change your filmmaking in any way um yeah for sure i mean i've just developed so much better habits i feel like everything everything kind of has to do with one or the other um so like when you become more spiritual i think with that comes um just better habits in general like i try and meditate like five at least five minutes a day um you know i try and i try and map out my day a little better than i used to as opposed to just like waking up and just like running as fast as I can. Now I try and set aside like, I'm like, this is my time to work out. This is my time to respond to emails. This is my time to do that. And I feel like just that overall has helped my overall creativity, like in crazy, crazy ways. Like having a balance between mind, body and soul. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not an expert like you yet, but I'm getting there. Oh, I'm, I'm no expert. And I see, I think I saw, I saw Danielle in the chat. Oh yeah, Kareem's in here. Um, who does your readings Danielle wants to know uh his name is Jade Luna he's a, he's incredible you like usually have to book him at least six months in advance he's he's incredible he does an hour-long reading and uh he's more of a I think it's called like an, a numerologist maybe where he he ties in like the the date and time you were born and does a whole reading based on numbers um but I did I have had a tarot card reading also recently uh from a friend of mine who does them and that's like, it's completely different from what Jay does, but that was a wild, wild trip. And it was, it was accurate what they said. I mean, we'll see. It's more about, the tarot reading was more about stuff that's about to happen, stuff that's going to happen this year for me. I'm going to bring my tarot card, so, tarot card reading too. Yeah, it's, it's so fun. It's so fun. I love it. Um, yep. So Emma Marie is asking you, what is it like being a part of so many people's creative processes? And she also asked, what was it like shooting Downfalls High? Um, well, I guess I started Downfalls High. Uh, it came out last week. Uh, it was just one of the most interesting, creative, random experiences I've ever been a part of, um, especially to do that during COVID. And it was insane. So I remember when uh, the video commissioner, Vincenza, first hit me about the job. I was actually at, literally at Dog Pound, or at the gym that's open and wearing this. I literally I walked outside and she was like, all right, so... Um, I have this project coming up with MGK. I have this budget. It's basically a 50 minute film and we have to shoot it in four days. And I was, at first I was like, are you kidding me? This sounds absolutely insane. I didn't want to do it at first to be honest. Cause like it was so, it just sounded so intimidating with like the, with the budget they had and what they wanted to pull off. Um, but after I was able to get off the call and think about it, I'm like, you know what? Like, screw it. Let's go. Right. Cause MG, MGK is someone I've worked with for like three years now. And we always, um put out amazing amazing work together so and especially you know the fact that sydney was in it and there was a scripted element to it it made it really exciting for me um you know because 
film and TV is the next the next step for me. So it felt like a really cool way to explore that and work with MGK and also, you know, my team who, you know, some people were working and not working because of COVID. And I felt like it was a really good opportunity. Um, they, they pretty much let me have my say with in terms of like who I wanted the team to be from the DP to the production designer to the editor and pretty much everyone across the board. They let me um, put the team together. And for me, that's like, that's one of the most exciting um, exciting parts about producing is is especially for artists who are directing. I feel like I've done that a lot recently um, because I really I really enjoy and I feel like I'm good at putting teams together because it's about you know it's about like who's best for that specific role. But you also have to think about it like drafting a a basketball team. It's like it's not just who's the best you know who's the best point guard and you know who's the best three point shooter. You have to think about yeah not only who's good at their specific role but are these people going to work well together and vibe together. And uh, I feel like I killed it in that capacity for this film because it was yeah. like literally like this, the experience like at the end when we wrapped. I actually have a video I haven't posted, never posted, but I uh, I will at some point uh, when we wrapped after the end of four days. And MGK like stood up on a chair and gave this like whole emotional speech, um, thanking everybody. And like literally like crew members were crying, like grips were tearing up, like everybody was crying because it was just such a just emotional four days for whatever reason it was just everybody you know like when you're on set and everybody's just at the same wavelength just the same energy and yeah. everyone's just in, in that flow state um I mean that's what I like look forward to for every project is when you're in that flow state it just becomes so much fun and it's not a job and you forget about you know the job aspect of it and uh and th like all four days like it was just everybody was in sync and it was and for because of that it's definitely my favorite project I've ever worked on that's amazing. Your last yeah. half project should probably be your favorite project you worked on because you always yeah. get more and get better, you know? Um, yeah. But you could tell in the way it came out, too, that there was, like, a very succinct... It's, like, such a package. And Sydney is, like, coming up like crazy. I was watching it um, with my friends that night, and, and like, this uh, roommate came in, and she was like, oh, my God, I know that guy about Little Huddy. You know? Yeah. Like, yeah. I, I had never heard of Little Huddy, but, like, he's huge, like... You had great um, actors in there too. So how yeah. much of it, um, cause you said it was scripted. So how much yeah. of the uh, finished product was like according to script and how much was improvised? I mean, pretty much everything was according to script. There was like a couple of scenes we had to, um, we had to think of on the spot, like, which is actually crazy how it turned, it worked out because for example, there's that scene where um, Chase and, and Sydney are laying on the grass outside and they look up and they see a plane and she would, and he's like, she was like, do you like airplanes? And he's like, I fucking hate airplanes. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was completely improvised because there was actually a plane flying over that exact moment. And uh, the weird thing is when we're looking back at the footage, we realized the bottom of the plane was actually pink, which is wild because the whole theme of the movie was what? pink. Oh. Like it just, it was so serendipitous. That's, but yeah. the only the only reason we had shot that scene outside was because the the bedroom scene we were supposed to shoot inside the house the production designer wasn't wasn't finished decorating it so we had to think on our feet of like what can we shoot in the meantime we we're like let's just shoot this scene on the grass and that scene where she's uh, on the grass laying on his chest is like one of the most iconic shots in the movie and that wasn't planned at all yeah yeah i love it i love what you posted about the casino reference yeah uh, with moonlight rollerway yeah fire yeah, yeah that was something we came up with on on the spot too we knew we had to get the story point of uh, Chase finding the uh, diary in the purse right. and kind of like the, I just looked up and I saw the outside and I was and I immediately thought of casino um, that one shot I'm like let's why don't we do this and MGK was like yes I love that and so we literally got that off the last shot of the day before we had to get off the off the property that's amazing Basically kicked off the property yeah um a lot of people keep asking how working with Nessa was with who Oh, yeah. Nessa. <laughs> yeah, she's she's not in Downfalls High, but we did do a, a music video uh, at the end of last year that is not out yet. What's that? Nessa's a rapper? No, Nessa, Nessa Barrett is a uh, an up-and-coming it. musician. Yeah. yeah, she's super dope. Um, I have a video coming out with her at some point soon. Um, and we shot, it was the last uh, project of last year that we did. But she's so dope. I loved her. My favorite thing about... Um, the downfalls high project but also working with nessa's working with all these new up-and-coming kids like everybody we casted in downfalls high was all uh through a relationship in one way or the other like um caroline sick brain is one of my closest friends and so i called her i'm like can you 
uh, and Maggie and Maddie come through um, and they came through and, and they uh, played the role of the three, the three friends um, in the, uh, uh, there are a couple of scenes, but uh, in the performance scene inside the bar who have that conversation and um, Chase was amazing to work with. And I love Chase and Sydney's chemistry together. It yeah. turned out amazing. I iconic movie couple for sure. Yeah. And so then like doing like, cause I know that you obviously want to make films. That's your, uh, your goal, right? Yes, it is. So, um, how does making something like, like this, like more musical, like movie, uh, music video hybrid compared to like mm. making a documentary or making a commercial, like, is yeah. there, yeah. Um, I mean, I think they're all different sides of the same coin. Like, I think each one is, uh, requires a different set of, of muscles, I guess, like filmmaking muscles, you know? And like, when I work on a documentary, it's just completely different from a music video because um, like Chris Brown's documentary, for example, we shot over, uh, I think it was like two years, but it wasn't like, it wasn't like uh, shooting every day for tears. You know, it's like we would pick up one interview this month and two interviews next month and then maybe take a month off you know and because of that it's just like it's more of a long-term game where you really have to kind of come at it from a different approach because with a music video it's like these are mainly one and two day shoots you have a couple of days of prep you wrap and then you have about a week or two for post uh hopefully <laughs> and um and that's different because you have to get in and know that you have 12 hours to get everything everything that you need and then for a documentary um you know sometimes you don't even know when it's going to end you know, and you just have to kind of go in with a, a game plan, but be ready for that game plan to constantly, ch you know, constantly change and evolve. Like, I think the toughest part about docs and especially Chris Brown's doc is like, you're interviewing people, you know, one at a time. So like this month, I would, for example, interview Mike Tyson, I, you know, I have all my questions for Mike. And um, he maybe might reveal something about Chris that I had never heard or learned before. So when I go interview Usher next month, I might look back at the Mike Tyson documentary and then pull things from that to kind of bring up in the Usher interview to see how he reacts to it. And because of that just constantly evolves and changes. So have you had like um, a documentary like drastically change in, um, in the storyline? Yeah, actually, uh, when I did Mary J. Blige's documentary, um, it was supposed to really be mainly about the making of her album, Strength of a Woman. Mm -hmm. um, and then toward the end of, of filming, she, uh, the whole scandal came out about her divorce with her husband and we had to kind of like switch gears you know obviously with her you know consent and wanting to right. go kind of let us film that direction and she let us um, one of the craziest experiences of my life like let us in the studio with her while she was recording songs about that situation that was so fresh and like we never of course none of us knew that was going to happen like we literally woke up all woke up to the same news on tv that that was happening with her husband and kind of chase that story angle, you know, with, with sensitivity, of course, because they're real people dealing with, with real things. And so that was kind of the first time the storyline, like, completely changed in the middle of production. But with docs, that kind of thing happens all the yeah, time. Exactly. I, yeah. I shot my first documentary before I ever shot a music video. And that storyline went so off the rails that I like, <laughs> you know what? I like these controlled environments. I'm good. Yeah. But now I'm ready to get back out there. I mean, the thing with docs is like, you really have to love whatever topic you're covering because it could be such a long, such a long term commitment that if you don't love what you're covering, it's going to feel way longer than it is. And you really be passionate about it. So that's why like, I'm a little more choosy about the docs I take on now, just because I know the time commitment um, and everything else. And I want to leave space for scripted projects and for music videos right. and commercials and that sort of thing. So you just got to be cognizant of that. You know, it's exciting sometimes to like, you don't want to hop on a dock, but you can't forget about the time commitment because it can be crazy and you can't just walk away halfway through, you know. How did you uh, start learning to say no to things? Because obviously when you first are starting out, you want to say yes to every opportunity, but then you get to a point where you're like, you know what, I can't be doing everything that gets thrown my way. So yeah, I mean, like naturally I want to do everything that comes my way. It's just like a uh, crazy OCD, just always wanting to work thing about me. But I obviously over the years did have to get a little bit more choosy and specific about the kind of artists and projects that I want to take on because, you know, I think it's important also you have to find your own voice. Um, and, you know, I think it's, it's a delicate balance between picking projects that um, where you're expressing 
you know, what the artist wants. I guess we're using music videos as an example, uh, expressing what the artist wants for whatever that song is or the album, album is or whatever ideas they have. But you also have to think about what you're trying to say as a filmmaker at the same time. So I think it's just all about being clear about your game plan and like really being clear about what you want to say as a director, as a filmmaker. And, you know, it wasn't really until the last couple of years that I became a little bit more cognizant of like the type of work I was putting out and the type of projects I was putting out. Um, but when I did become more aware of that and really did become more clear about the kind of projects I wanted to do, um, I manifested those projects. Like those type of projects started to come my way. Love. Um, yeah, when you're clear about it, you know, like manifestation. Yeah, like it wasn't until like two years ago that I started working with, um, you know, alt rock and rock artists like Blink-182 and Machine Gun Kelly when he started to do rock music and those I artists. Oh, so. Yeah, and they, just, and they just kept coming like young blood and like I love that kind of I love that kind of work, you know, I still do hip hop videos and, and rap videos occasionally, but it has to really make sense for me nowadays. Um, and really, because if I don't like something, I just learned that it just doesn't always come out great. <laughs> you know, and that's a hard lesson I learned over time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so someone asked if there was a specific movie genre that you gravitated towards. Movie genre? Yeah, I guess. Um, make it. Hey, Lizzie. In terms of what? In terms of wanting wanting to uh, make it. I like what kind of, there's a specific ter time, uh, type of genre you gravitate yeah. making. And then I want to piggyback off of something you said too, because you said um, you want to, like, it's about the type of things that you want to say. So have you figured that out, what you want? your voice to be saying as a yeah player. what's up lizzie i see lizzie down there in the chat um so i think i think i always say for me like before i even define what kind of genre um i want to explore for me it's always about character and story like it has to be unique character and unique story first before i even look at look at genre right so if it's if it's a character that excites me or a character i can relate to i think relatability is the biggest thing for me because um you know what what the kind of projects right now that i have in development are all have something special about the the main character that i can relate to and and that's why i think i'm the best person to do those projects um so first character and then genre i typically uh i typically go toward like coming of age type films or on the other side i love thrillers um thriller projects uh yeah what was the second question right what you know um yeah oh the question was if you knew what you wanted wait, what kind of what wait i'm gonna flip that back back on you though what kind of what kind of films are you looking to make i don't think um, i've ever asked you that definitely i think um i realized recently i'm into like a hero's journey type of stuff but like a heroine's journey type of situation <laughs> yeah um, I feel like cerebral like make you think like look at things in a different way you know like uh but yeah, coming of age for sure. And that doesn't even necessarily need to mean like at 17 years old. I feel like coming of age happens when you shift your life into like what you want to do with your life. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So yeah. Um, yeah, definitely stories like that where underdog stories where people like take control of. And I agree with you. It's not so much about genre as it is about uh, character and you know, yeah, you can't really direct characters that you can't relate to. So I agree mm. with you. That's super important. Yep. Um, did you have a, was there a first movie that you saw that you were like, this is the movie that like made you want to direct? Do you remember those first few movies you saw? Um, I mean, it's kind of like, I don't know, it's kind of a handful of, of movies. Like I'm a huge Scorsese fan. I like him for certain reasons. David Fincher, I've always looked up to and his body of work is inspiring. Like some of the first like classic films I watched was, uh, you know, uh, Sunset Boulevard, um, Donnie Brasco. Mm -hmm. um, I love, and sometimes I'll, I'll you know, I'll, I'll mix it up in terms of what I watch now. You know, I'll, I'll definitely put on some classics just to kind of remind myself of, of why I started. But I feel like, um, yeah, Fincher, anything Scorsese. And of course, Spielberg, you know, Jaws. Right. right. Um, he made the first blockbuster, so I feel that. Yeah. Do you... Um did because you went to usc right yeah so, where, do you think that film school like really helped you um i feel like everyone has their own own experience with film school personally for me it, i i learned a lot more right out of film school right um i was the last class at usc to shoot on film 
So right after my years, when they transitioned everything to digital, um, they built a new building um, that Spielberg funded and the whole program kind of shift gears into the digital age. So I was kind of like on the tail end of, of kind of the old USC film school and the new film school. So because of that, I just felt like maybe there was, uh, it, it wasn't really, a lot of the things I learned wasn't necessarily relevant to the way the industry was changing at that time. Like I remember uh, when I was a senior at USC's when the Canon uh, 5D or 7D first came out mm -hmm. um, and we were still shooting on like HVX 200, which right. like we, we added this like mount at the end that had this thing that spun to give it that like 24 frames per second filmic look. Um, so uh, I really think it was more about the projects I was shooting outside of school. But I mean, film school is, was cool. <laughs> USC's going to hate me for, for saying that everywhere. I, it, I, it definitely is like it works for some people and doesn't work for others. So yeah, yeah, um, I think it's all about like how, how you learn, you know, like every person learns differently. And like, for me, I, I learn most by doing, you know, I learn most by just like getting out there and throwing myself in the deep end um, and learning, not being afraid to make mistakes. Um, like one of my first projects that I produced out right out of film school was a music video for Chris Brown and Nicki Minaj. And it was the first music video I'd ever produced. And how I kind of just, what's that? How did you get the gig? Um, it was a, a production company at the time, Riveting Entertainment. I was working with them on, on a, a couple other projects and, and that came up and they asked if I wanted to hop on it. And I kind of lied a little bit about my producing experience. Right. Um, but luckily, you know, the team over there really supported me and, you know, they obviously knew that I was, um, you know, newer in the game, but they surrounded me with a really amazing team of, a, you know, production manager and coordinator. And of course the EP was amazing. Um, and I really learned by really just watching the people around me. I think when you surround yourself with a good team, I think it's okay if you don't know everything. Yeah, for sure. You always want to be working with people that know more than you or that you could uh, learn from. Yeah. I mean, if, if you're not willing to jump in the water, even when you're not ready, then you're never going to grow. Exactly. You'll never be ready unless you take the leap. I see everybody keeps asking about downfalls part two. <laughs> <laughs> Is that ready? Right now there's no plans for it, but I guess you never know, right? I would, I mean, I would, I would love to. So we'll see what happens. Yeah. It, that is a amazing magnum opus for sure. Like literally I'm getting all like DMs from all kinds of different people asking about part two, even people pitching me on like possible storyline plots for part two. It's like making pretty, pretty amazing. Versions of it. Yeah, like bringing Sydney back and like ideas on how to uh, <laughs> how to spin off the, the series into something different. It's funny. Have you been sharing them with Kells? <laughs> no, no, maybe I should. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I feel like, you know, he'd probably want to know. Yep. I was sad because Kevin and Barracuda is like the best thing I've ever heard. And I wanted that right? on the in the movie so badly. <laughs> I know. I know. I love that too. Genius. Um, so do you have a dream location you want to shoot in? Because I know you've already shot in South mm -hmm. Africa, Bulgaria, Damn. Ukraine. Wow. No one's ever asked me that before. I haven't shot in Ukraine, but I definitely want to shoot there. Um, my EP Frank Boren has shot there a bunch of times. He just shot the uh, Zane rehab video there right. with Ivana. Um, and he's just always raving about shooting in Ukraine. I can't wait to go there. Yeah. Uh, so, so that's your spot? Ukraine's your spot? Because I feel yeah, we'll like I that. answer because I mentioned it because I thought you were there. No, no, that's, on, that's honestly true. That's like out of all the places that we bring up about filming, that is always a top one. So you must have sensed it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's like top of my list for sure. Um, so it's out of uh, out of the States, it's just been Bulgaria and South Africa or where else have you shot? Um, South Africa, Bulgaria, Tokyo, Kyoto, uh, New Zealand, which was incredible. I think that's it. I mean, but Kyoto definitely, I mean, all those places were so amazing for different reasons. Like, honestly, shooting out of state has like been my most transformative experiences out of everything I've done. Like there's like, there's nothing that transforms you more than like just being dropped in a foreign place and just having to rely on your instincts and your gut and just rely on your process. Like I remember when I went to go shoot Youngblood in Bulgaria, um, I was literally shooting, we like wrote the treatment on like a Monday 
and there was a possibility of us going on like Wednesday. And Wednesday I was shooting Love. club, it, it's insane, right? In, yeah. in, in Bulgaria, Wednesday I was shooting the Blink-182 uh, Dark Side music video. So the night before Frank was like, called me and he was like, hey, like just so you know, we haven't heard, we, we don't know if you're going yet, but just pack a, pack a bag and bring it to set tomorrow, just in case. I'm like, how? Okay, that's insane. But okay, I think we wrapped it. We wrapped it like 8 p.m. But I packed a bag, and I remember at lunchtime on the Blink 182 video, he's like, "All right, we just got the video awarded. Um, you're gonna be driven to the airport as soon as we wrap, and then you're going to Bulgaria." I'm like, so you, cool. you packed your bags for Bulgaria? Yeah, yeah. Brought it to set, and literally oh. still not knowing. Yeah, and then it was just it was crazy because we had to I had to connect in um in uh, Germany to get to Bulgaria. And when I got to, to Germany, it was, uh, it was nighttime there. And when I landed there for my connecting flight, they said the flight was the connecting flight was canceled. And this is the day before my tech scout. So like, I, was, I think like Thursday night, my tech scout was Friday. And they, they had to put me in a hotel for the night. And I'd be put on the first flight out to Bulgaria the next morning, which is crazy. So literally, they had to push my whole tech scout and we're shooting on Saturday. So like, I landed in Bulgaria Friday afternoon at like noon. And we went literally the producer, the whole team I'd never met before that day or even really talked to, um, picked me up from the airport. I literally went straight from the airport to the, the scout where we were shooting. And literally had 24 hours to put together that Young Blood video. But I think that was just, it was one of the best lessons of my life because you just, I just had to rely on, on just trusting the process and just trusting everything in real time because there was no time to think. And I'm working with people who are, you know, locals to Bulgaria. Some people don't speak great English. You know, I've yeah. never worked with this crew before. But it was interesting, though, even though there's that language barrier, it's like film, you know, really is a universal language. Like we all, you know, no matter where you're shooting, it's yeah. like you always are, there's always this unspoken flow that I think is just really fucking dope. And you got nominated for awards with that video. So clearly, like, yeah. you were in the zone. Have you yeah. seen Soul, the movie? Which one? Soul, the new Disney. Movie. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You know how, exactly. Like, phone. So true. You That's guys... so true. Yeah, I mean, fuck. That was like the, that was one of the craziest, craziest experiences of my life. And it's crazy because even on set that morning when Young Blood showed up, we walked. It was my first time meeting him. Even on set that morning, we walked through the whole story, and then together oh, we just that completely. Be that before I think I'm not okay. Oh, I think... Um. Was it? No, actually, it was after. So we did mean I think I'm, I think I'm okay. But he was a feature on that. So we just kind of came in, did a thing and left, you know. But I mean, it was the first time we had even really spoken about this video concept, even. Mm -hmm. um, so like, when, when he came to set that morning, we walked through the whole story. He didn't like certain parts of it. Because um, we hadn't really talked about the storyline. And I miscommunicated. Or there was a miscommunication on like what he wanted versus what I wanted. Um, but then when he explained to me what he wanted, it made perfect sense. So like literally that morning on set, we changed pretty much the whole entire narrative concept of the video in real time. But like, there's no time to think. So it's like, you just right. like, but that's where like experience comes in handy and just learning from prior mistakes. You just carry something new with you from every job into the next job. Um, and then what's up, Connor? I'll see you down there. Why did you guys shoot in Bulgaria, by the way? Um, he was somewhere out near there. Oh. And that, that was like, for some reason, a central place for us to meet and also have this like World War II set. There's like a like it's like a handful of World War II standing sets on that side of the world, I guess. Um, like by set, I mean like a back lot uh, that has like a that standing set that we didn't have to come in and build. That was like built for like either a TV show and they left it up, you know, or it's like there for some other reason. And um, you, you know, I'm just letting people know right, right, right. <laughs> who might not know. And um, so that's just a place we chose. But like. I had the most incredible time working with that team. We actually shot two music videos there over two days. The first one was was more difficult, so we kind of put more focus on that. But both of them are some of my favorite work I've ever done, for sure. And the first one's nominated for the MVPA Best Rock Video when this you, year. Oh, when is the award? I don't, I don't know. I'm not sure. Well, we got to find out. Let's get it. <laughs> um, and so, oh, how how did? Two things. What did you shoot in New Zealand? What did you shoot in Japan? And I guess how uh, all those experiences abroad, like, is there any sort of common, I guess the common denominator is that film is universal language, right? But like, yeah. are there any like, do you ever have like a culture shock moment uh, shooting 
outside the States where you were like, whoa, that's different. I mean, Tokyo was super different. Um, and then especially when we got to Kyoto, we were shooting a film that was between, that we shot in Kyoto and Tokyo and New Zealand. Um, oh, and wow. then when we, yeah, we got to Tokyo and it was snowing. And I guess it was the one, it only snows one day a year there. And we happened to catch that day, which right. actually worked way better for what we were shooting. But like, it was incredible to see Tokyo with snow on it. But that was definitely the most culture shock was Tokyo. And then Kyoto, we filmed um, at some ancient temples. And that was just like, mind blowing. Movie. Uh, it, didn't, it hasn't come out yet. Oh, okay. Yeah, but I'll well, let you know. I'm excited to see when it does <laughs> come out. Yeah. Um, and then is your family in film? Because you're from here. Yeah, I'm from here, but I'm the first in my family to pursue film. Okay, so were they supportive or like, were they always supportive or was there a moment where they were like, you should go do something a little bit safer? No, they're pretty much always supportive, actually. I got really lucky. Um, I, I, uh, I started acting when I was super young, when I was like nine years old. Um, I said I wanted to be in commercials and TV and film stuff as an actor. So I did that for about four or five years until I realized that I, I really wanted to focus on the other, you know, the other side of the camera. And so I stopped acting when I was about 13. But because of that, uh, everything about film and, and production became pretty normalized with my family, just because, you know, my mom would have to be on set with me or, you know, and um, yeah. So do you relate to the movie Honey Boy? <laughs> no, I mean, like, I, I loved it. Like, I didn't really relate to it because I feel like my experience was so much different. Like right. I really didn't have any negative experience with um, with acting and my mom or my parents really never pressured me into it. It was something that I always wanted to do and they were just super supportive of it. Um, so I got very lucky in that in that regard. Um, what's like your biggest passion outside of filmmaking? Um, biggest passion, I guess right now I'm on a health health journey. So right now that's that's my passion is is uh, getting fit and eating right. And just finding more balance in my life. It's important. Because I feel like yeah. when you have like such specific goals, it's very easy to be like, I don't have time to work out. I don't have time to eat a balanced meal. You yeah. Know? And it's what we were saying before. Like you need to have a balanced trifecta of mind, body, and soul to have everything working. Yeah. I really have to, to be able to, like for me, if I don't work out or feel good, then I just, I don't do good work. It's just like how my body is wired. Um, so it's, it's almost like I have to, like every morning I have to do something physical or, you know, I have to eat right as, you know, as best as I can. Because if I don't feel good, I just like everything else just kind of like falls apart. And this is a recent journey of yours? Uh, I mean, I've been, I've always been like, I've always been healthy. I've never been not healthy. But right now I'm just trying to put extra focus and attention on it. And so you're, you're structured in that regard. Yeah. Like 6 a.m. We go boxing. I got, I got a, yeah, I got a trainer. I got a meal plan. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, we're on like, we're on week, I think this is week three. Okay, cool. Yeah. And you've been seeing gains. I've been seeing the gains. Gains. The gains are coming through. Yeah, I mean, if I don't post about it, then, then it then did it really happen, happen, right? It didn't really happen. Yeah, you're about to be the video boy in the next, like, Ariana Grande video. <laughs> Should I put myself as a lead myself. guy? <laughs> Anyone, anyone got questions down there? I have see, six I questions Dean here. In there. Hit me. Oh, never mind. It's all the same person saying we want downfall high part two. Of please. course. It was too short. And then when are you making magic together? Was another one I got. So when we make a question, magic, we got to. I think that I, would be super fun, actually. I feel like now we're like in a in the same uh, family because I feel like you work with Jesse a lot or sometimes right with Mike. Yeah, stuff. yeah, I've, I've produced for Mike and, and Jesse before. I love yeah. the Cinema Giants fam. So I think uh, we got something in the works in 2021. We got to. Yeah. Um, someone said coming to shoot a Kenya. So who's your favorite director? Cool. You answer that. Scorsese and Fincher, you said, right? Yeah, I like them for different reasons. But those are my top, my top two, for sure. My are Spike Jones and Richard Linklater. I enjoy their work. I wouldn't say they're my, my top, my favorite directors, but I, I love their movies. What's your favorite Scorsese? Hmm, favorite Scorsese. I mean, <laughs> I love Wolf of Wall Street, of course. Um, Gangs in New York, I love. 
um departed I don't, there's really not one for me like i just love his body of work do you see a good period piece in your future that'd be awesome i would love that i mean does 90s count i mean honestly at this point, <laughs> at this point it is it is at yeah point, put a blockbuster in a scene and you got yeah. period piece so. yeah, 90s film in the work what about right. you what's oh, your what's your favorite if you could yeah if you could pick every any any uh time period to do a movie in what would it be any time period uh like i do have a film that i want to make and it's like i guess it's the roaring 20s ish like the end of the 199 like the big yeah the beginning of the roaring 20s but also like 1969 like I was so mad I didn't see uh, Sunset Boulevard when Tarantino oh. made it all like Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Did yeah, you... no. We were right there. We were right there. I know, right? Ugh. But yeah, I, I would say the 60s or or the 20s. What about you, 90s? Um, No, I mean, I would love... 60s is dope. 20s is dope. Um, I'm working on something that's kind of like early 2000s, which is is... I know it's not like you know a time period like the 20s but, per se i think at this point though maybe maybe it's getting there um but i'm working on like a music driven narrative film that takes place in the early 2000s um so yeah that's kind of a cool time period i see dean is asking how where do you get uh grab inspiration or write treatments you want to answer it first for you me? yeah and then i'll go sure <laughs> um cool. Definitely like Pinterest and shot deck for sure. But sometimes like I'll see a scene in something that I'm watching or like even, you know, look at like if I, I like window shopping a lot or just like <laughs> yeah. thing. So if I'm like walking down a street and I see a nice window display, I'm like, hmm, I see a scene in there somewhere. You know what I do you mean? Have, do you have a photo album in your phone just dedicated to treatment, music if video, inspo? If enough, I would. But <laughs> yeah. I about 50 Pinterest and like my desktop is looks like there's a virus because oh my god all, you're one of those because of all the screenshots yeah like I clean that would my, drive me nuts I cleaned my desktop like two weeks ago and I already have so many screenshots yeah. on it, but I've been trying to get better about organizing like photos and, and stuff and on my phone and my computer like when I have spare time I'll just like spend 10 minutes like dragging photos into like like specific folders um, cause I'm, I'm like, I was reading my website and I'm trying to go back and look for stills and like BTS photos. And it's just like, it's so annoying to have to scroll through my entire exactly. photo album and find specific things. So I've been like slowly trying to like semi-organize things. I've been doing it slowly too. So where do you grab inspiration from? Um, I mean, I get a lot of my imagery from, from shot deck. Like I used to, oh. I used to lean toward more like, obviously like Pinterest, like everybody to try and find inspo, but um i feel like lately i've been trying to only find inspiration in other films usually yep. like feature films I'm um way right now. yeah because i hate like when i was starting when i was pulling inspo from pinterest i just felt like sometimes my work would just start to look like pinterest <laughs> you know like it wasn't as it wasn't like the vibes i was really going for yep. but it's tough because like treatments are always hard that way because like they want something they always want something new and fresh feeling but you also have to find references to try and explain what you want to do so it's like kind of like a combination of of like finding fresh new images but also making it feel like it hasn't been done before yeah it's so it's a, definitely a tricky thing it's a, definitely a skill like learned over time treatment making sure. it's not easy shot deck is pinterest but it's it's only from movies basically shot deck and then right. i would definitely rather shoot a sci-fi film would you rather shoot a mafia film or a sci-fi Ooh, I think Mafia for me, but I definitely would want to shoot a sci-fi one day. For I did, yeah, exactly. I feel like just because of that, I, I got to put that before sci-fi. But have you seen, um, do you watch Alex Garland's work? Who? He did ex Alex Garland, the director, he did Ex Machina. He does oh, like mainly sci-fi movies. Yeah. I, I, lo love I loved Ex Machina. What, what else has he done? Um, he did a movie like two years ago that was his follow-up to that, but I didn't like as much. Uh, what was it called? Let's look. But yeah, those are those are my types of movies, I um, feel. Like I loved Ex Machina and then he did um what's it called? Oh. 
Annihilation. Oh, I saw, I've heard of it, but I with, haven't seen it. With, with Natalie have Portman. You, have you read this book? No. What is that? I can't see it. Um, It's called Easy Riders, Raging Bulls. How the oh, I've heard sex, of that. drugs, and rock and roll generation saved Hollywood. That's dope. I'll let you borrow it. But um, it yeah. takes place from, from 1969, Easy Rider, to 1980, Raging Bull. That's awesome. And um, you that. would love it because it's all about the friendship between George Lucas and Scorsese. That's and sick. Spielberg, Raging Bull is like definitely like... What? Raging Bull, is, Raging Bull is definitely a film that changed my life when I saw it for the first time. How so? Like What's 100%. Uh, I can remember seeing it for the first time in high school. I think I was like a sophomore in a film, like a film 101 film studies class. But uh, just seeing that at, at the age I was at, it just like blew me away. The way the storytelling was, the cinematography um, for a black and white film was incredible. I just remember seeing that in Sunset Boulevard. And those were two movies out of like all the classic films we watched that just blew me away. It mean, mean streets, but did you ever, did you study film? Yeah, in, in college. Yeah. What do you think about film school? Did you, did you feel like you learned a lot? Um, I feel like I I was probably scared to, like, pick up a camera or, like, <laughs> try and edit something before film school, you know? Yeah. Also, just, like, the way uh, the medium is the message, you know? Yeah. In terms of, like, it's crazy how, like, all the science... The, one of the biggest facts I learned from film studies is, like... um how all the like sci all the like scary movies of the day are whatever like society fears right now so right mm. now society's fearing the end of the world there's going to be some nat mm. natural disaster so like there's all these scary movies that have to do with that you know whereas like 20 years ago it was like alien aliens and aids or whatever like just whatever whatever um is happening on screen is telling of what's happening in society and once mm. you start noticing that pattern it you see it in in movies which makes sense obviously because you know we're telling the stories around us right but yeah that's interesting i think it was spielberg who said like film film certain like film genres come back around every 10 years like whether it be a western or like sci-fi they all kind of they have their moment and they come back around usually 10 years later which is I, interesting, like the trend. I feel like that's happening. It happens in music too. Like I feel like that's happening right now with like, you know, yeah. definitely bringing back like alt rock right now. Mm. You know, um, if you weren't a producer director, what other role would you take on? Uh, hmm. like within film, I guess. Or How, what, what would, I what mean, would you life if you weren't a director? Pro probably, probably a cinematographer. I guess so I couldn't direct or produce. Um. I don't do that just because I love directing so much. And I just feel like there's so many talented cinematographers that, and, and I enjoy collaborating with a cinematographer more yep. than I want to be one. So that's why I'm not one. But I think it would be that for sure. Have you ever shot your own stuff like on an Alexa or a Red or anything? Uh, no, I haven't actually on a Red Alexa. Like I used to DP my own stuff in film school and like my own short right. films and stuff back in the day, obviously. But um, I, haven't, I haven't been the director and DP on anything, no. My Have favorite you? class in film school. What's that? What favorite it? class in film school? Um, it was actually a film studies class, which is, uh, I was in production. We had to take some uh, film studies classes. It was uh, on Hitchcock. We have like one of the top, USC is one of the top uh, professors in Hitchcock in the world. That's fire. And um, it was, it was so sick. That, and then also we had a TV composer, or TV symposium class where every week we'd watch an episode from, some sort of from some tv series and then they would have um either someone from the crew or the casting crew or someone from the cast come and talk about the process of the show and that was interesting to me i love tv i definitely that's something i definitely want to do air class in um college also yeah I remember i did a i did one um like my like thesis was on uh family and like family mm. in tv because that also like the way tv goes about like telling stories of what's going on like now you're seeing a lot more like diverse families like you know blended families whether that means like a gay uncle or an adopted kid you know like interracial whatever like you're seeing all these families that are more like telling of how society is now whereas like back in the day it might have been like you know okay like we started off with like the brady bunch you know yeah then we had the cosby show we had a black family that was like well off on tv that was a big deal you know then we had modern family that was like 
every every possible kind of like non-nuclear thing you could have all in yeah so. i watched uh do, do you have master class do you watch that ever yeah there's a new uh isa ray master class oh, yeah. yeah is it good I, I watched it last night it's incredible but she talks a lot it? about yeah it's not that long it's like an hour long wow but it's incredible but she talks a lot about uh diversity in tv um but it was incredible i highly highly recommend it i i will definitely watch it what's your favorite tv show Favorite TV show currently? There's a show on Showtime called Your Honor. Have you heard of it with Brian Cranston uh, from um, Breaking Bad? Someone was shooting a short film in my apartment in a couple of weeks, and they were talking to their DP about a shot in Your Honor yesterday. Oh my god, it's mind blowing. It's definitely my favorite show on TV right now. Okay, so definitely check it out. Of all time. Uh, favorite show of all time, probably Breaking Bad. Okay. Yeah. Which cool. it just happens to both star Brian Cranston, just by coincidence. Incredible actor. Yeah. So I feel you. I've been watching WandaVision. Oh, I wanted to start that. Is it good? It's incredible. All right. I'll check it out. Really good. Um, and yeah, I'm a big uh, Mad Men, Sopranos girl. Love Mad Men. I never saw Sopranos, actually, which is crazy. I know. Wait, you love Mafia and you haven't seen yeah. Those? I just it's one of those things where I, I I didn't watch it when it first came out and I just never never got around to it. Should I start it? Andrew, yes. I would I <laughs> would start it all over again. Like and be watching it with you because I've been telling myself to start the Sopranos over like for a while. Sopranos right. is, Yes. I'll check it out. A mafioso like you definitely has to see the Sopranos. Got to. That's a fact. That's a fact. Oh my god, my mom just said, "Oh my god," because my mother's obsessed with The Sopranos. Really? Uh, <laughs> it's okay, she's tuning in. Oh I my god, that. best! I love that. <laughs> That's funny, but yeah. Um, so, what's on the what's on the agenda for uh, for the rest of the year? What's the year? Let's manifest oh, it. Let's speak it into existence. I know. I mean, definitely a film project happening. I feel like it keeps getting delayed because of, of COVID. I was supposed to start when. Uh, last year right before covid but definitely that's in the works and has to happen this year but we'll see i feel like it's just right now i'm just taking it one step at a time just because of you know the the current climate and everything else um but right. i think what's that are you writing also um i don't really write myself but i'm working with a couple of different writers on a couple on different projects um and i i love that a lot more than writing myself because i love i love collaborating with writers and giving feedback on it from a director standpoint and to just work with diverse writers is really cool who have a completely different view, you know viewpoint or totally. set of experiences than you is really dope for me and so do you like give them a like a prompt or you're just like taking from um them? no usually like at least the like the three projects i'm working on right now all originated from the writer there are log lines that the writer the writer came up with um or the plot and then i just helped develop it with them I don't have I don't have time to write. Like one of uh, my mentors, um, uh, who's a, a big producer, he told me writers write. He's like, if you're not a writer, if you're not writing twelve hours a day, you're not a writer. And yeah. so let the writers write. I feel it. I feel it. Do yeah. you have original stories that you want to get out there? That once you like find your Charlie Kaufman, you might write them. Or no, like I don't really have any original stories that that uh, I want to tell like that are about my life or stories about my life, but I re I'm really drawn to biopics. Like I have a couple uh, stories that I've biopics. optioned from biopics. Like I've optioned- I love biopics. Of, I, I, lo I mean, that's biopic, like, but... that's my thing. Like I've, I've optioned a couple of books and, and articles that I found and I'm developing projects based on those. But for me, like I love finding IP and developing IP rather than original stories, just my just what I love. I love like I love real human stories. I think maybe that comes from the yeah. documentary side of me, maybe. Truth is stranger than fiction. Did you take documentary classes? No, actually, I didn't. I kind of I got thrown into documentaries because right out of college, one of my first jobs was um, making video content for this entrepreneur um, that uh, Gerard Adams is actually really close with. And uh, he was like a business. He had a, a book coming out called Nothing to Lose Everything to Gain. Uh -huh. And he wanted to hire somebody to just make content, like short little clips, uh, just around the book release. So he hired me on a retainer and out of college, it was the dopest thing ever to like have somebody who was, who hired me on a retainer to yeah. just shoot content 
because it's so hard to get work right out of film school, especially paid work. And uh, so I did that. And then a lot of stuff was happening in his life around the book release. And we just, uh, it went from doing content around the book to just filming kind of his life. And that just kind of like snowballed into a documentary. And that was my first, my first one. And you were doing everything. You were, you were directing, shooting, editing the content. Yeah, for that one, I was doing everything. Shooting, I was shooting on my Canon 7D at the time. I was editing it. It was, man, it was so crazy because we'd fly all around the country for different like book tours and speaking engagements. So it's like, you know, I was, I had my backpack with my 7D in it and my laptop and every night you're dumping the footage onto hard drives. But I feel like, you know, earning your stripes that way and like doing all that at the beginning was like, I look back on it, I'm like, that taught me everything. Like to be able to come out the gate and like shoot your own stuff, even just like the process of dumping footage onto a hard drive, like just dumb stuff like that, that, that you learn, like when you have an understanding of all of it, it just kind of, I think helps you oversee it all from now from a director standpoint or producer standpoint. Um, so actually on that topic, um, cause I feel like people don't really realize, like it took me four years to get a $5,000 budget. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like four years I was directing shit with no budget at all. You know what yeah. I mean? But now like people are like, kind of like, um, they feel entitled to like $5,000 budgets when it's like, do you know how long it fucking took me of blood, sweat and tears to get that $5,000 budget? You know? So it's true. Like, what was your first like career jump in that regard? Or like, did you not really have one because you had that documentary? Um, I mean, the documentary was like its own thing over here. And then I just luckily around that same time, I started working with Riveting Entertainment, who was, uh, they were doing huge music videos at the time and they were doing everything for Chris Brown, um, all his music videos. But because I did uh, the Nothing to Lose documentary, when I was working with Riveting on the music video side, I pitched them the idea. I'd done like, I'd worked with them on a bunch of Chris Brown music videos. So I pitched them the idea about doing a documentary on Chris because he hadn't done one yet. Um, and I had just done that that one documentary. So I don't know what I was, who I thought I was pitching it to <laughs> Chris. But you know what? You like, sometimes you just gotta like, sometimes you just gotta shoot for the stars and then, exactly. you know, hope it works out. And he said yes. And I was like, all right, shit. Well, I guess I gotta learn how to, put the pieces together for a doc like in a real professional way because it's not going to be just me running around with a camera because those days at that time I did not want to do that again like I did it once and uh, I have so much respect for videographers of celebrities who do it all you know like I'm close I'm close with a lot of them like one of my best friend uh, best friends Ben Haggerty shoots for Beyonce and um, Ivan Barrio shoots for Cali but it's not easy to do it all like so like so many sleepless nights and having to turn around edits so quickly it's like its own skill set that is like totally. insane to me but like where i find where what excites me is the collaboration on set so that's why i i i literally sold my camera i was like i don't even want to own the camera anymore because everybody was asking me to like to shoot that kind of content and i didn't want it anymore so i'm like in my mind i was like if i don't have a camera then i can just say i don't have a camera without like because i'm a sucker like i want to work all the time like i don't like saying no to things i want to make everyone happy all the time i mean you know back then so just not having a camera was like my way of being like uh i don't you know i can't do it <laughs> you can hire me to direct but i don't know about shooting yeah i feel you but but i learned so much by doing that like if if there's any like tip i can give to somebody coming up it's like do everything you know like that you can get your hands on because you learn so much about storytelling from editing like i would not be the director that i i am and do the kind of work that I do because I used to edit all my own stuff even up until like two years ago yeah. and then I finally I finally was able to work with an amazing editor um Shannon Griffin who started kind of you know Shannon too who uh she's my started as my intern and like I kind of taught her about the way that I like to edit things and my style and she came up and now she's doing some of the biggest videos in the game so now I pass all my projects off because it's just better works out better for me but having had all the editing experience now when I'm on the set I am able to know exactly what I want to shoot because I already edit, I already have it edited in my head. And because of that, it's like, I'm able to get more shots and more setups out of the day because I'm not just like shooting unnecessary shit. Um, so. how, how much do you storyboard? Um, it, it, it depends. Like I don't really storyboard as much as I do like beat sheets. So if I'm doing like a music video mm -hmm. that has some sort of narrative tied into it, um, I usually just do a beat sheet of like story moments that I know I need to get for it to have connective tissue. Um, Cause I'm not, I'm not an artist, you know, and obviously like on most of these videos, we can't really afford a storyboard artist all the time. 
Um, but for me, the storyboard stuff only like really, really uh, comes in handy either when I'm doing VFX based videos, just so we can oh. have a kind of a game plan going into it, or when I'm doing commercial work, because commercial work, you really have to be in sync with the client. So if you're able to have a storyboard ahead of time, and the client's able to see that, then there won't be any surprises on set. But I feel like for basic music videos, the storyboard kind of sometimes throws me off, actually, because some of my best stuff just kind of comes organically. Yeah, that's how music videos yeah. operate. It's such a case, different case. Case, do you storyboard? For VFX stuff. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. If something like needs to be specific with the VFX, then those are the things I've storyboarded. But mm -hmm. hold on a second. Any any last questions, guys? Thanks for tuning in. Do, do, do. What's up, Chris? I see you down there. Uh, someone asked mm -hmm. three minute storytelling versus thirty minute stories. Which one is most complex or hard to execute? Say that again. <laughs> <laughs> someone said three minute storytelling versus thirty minute stories. Which one is most complex or hard to execute? Hmm stories or music videos i don't know i feel like they both like they have their own set of challenges like three minute three minute stories hard to execute because you got to tell a you know a story in a short amount of time so it's like how do you what's the best way to execute that without you know missing key points i feel like maybe 30 minutes is a little bit easier because you have a little more time to develop your ideas a little bit um and three minutes you got to kill a lot of a lot of babies as they say right it's kill your darlings yeah I have a Babies, question. darlings, you know. Something. Do you prefer uh, directing to producing, or producing mm -hmm. to directing, or you you love both in different ways? Um, definitely, definitely directing, but I I still love both. I don't produce ma like now as much as I used to. Um, I kind of. So. What's that? You're still producing a lot, though. Um, I mean, definitely not as much as I used to. Like, like three, four years ago, I was I was producing a lot more than I was directing, just because. As a director, it's hard to, it's really hard to get, excuse me, it's really hard to get your foot in the door and like, and, and uh, if you haven't done other music videos, obviously, like, it's hard to just step in and get big budgets as a director to execute your ideas. Um, so because of that, I started off producing because it was just, it's easier to get work as a producer. Wow. Because it's not, it's not, it's not so much based on, on your, the videos you've done so much as like a company or director just willing to take a risk on you or like willing to because the label doesn't hire the producers the production company does you know what i mean right I um so because that's easier thing. i also didn't realize you started out with documentaries so i guess i'm learning things about you wait you didn't realize that what that you started as a producer yeah i didn't realize that you started from documentaries so i'm yeah, learning like conversation. yeah like my first three three four years in music videos it was really only producing like I produced, I think about like 25 music videos for Chris Brown before I even um, directed anything. Was but Chris I've, one you directed for as well? Uh, Chris Brown documentary or music video? Uh, music video. Um, no, because Chris, Chris directs his own music video. So I really just produced for Chris, but um, because of the producing stuff, I really was able to, to really actually learn about directing. Like when you produce for different kinds of directors, you know, I was able to learn about different styles and, um, you know, the directors I produce for now are just certain directors like uh, Shane Drake, Shane Drake, who's a good friend of mine, and I'll produce for him whenever he calls me. Um, but it's so dope to actually step out of the directing seat, step in or sit in the producer's chair, and then kind of like see behind the scenes of different legends, you know, like producing yeah. for like Jesse and producing for Mike, producing for Shane, they all have their own unique approach. And I feel like when I produce for different directors, I take a little bit of what I learned from each of them and, you know, implement what works for me and what doesn't. Yeah, I love that. Because I've only really ever directed. So like my own, yeah. I produced for different people, but I'm definitely obviously more of a director. So I like, I'm envious of that experience a little bit because it's like, it's what you said, you know, like I yeah. don't know the way I direct mainly, you know, so yeah. like the way other people direct, like it's the same way when you're like on crew when you're an art director or production designer or whatever, like, DP, like you see how other people operate. Whereas when you're yeah. the director, you're only really on your own sets, you know, so. Yeah, I mean, the reason why I don't produce so much anymore is, is because I'm not your typical producer. Like I don't, I'm not just a line producer. Like I don't really, and production managers and coordinators who've, who've worked for me know know this, um, that, you know, it's not 
usually when I produce, it's because I also direct. So a lot of directors feel super comfortable of uh, with me producing for them because like a lot of artists like, you know, MGK or Chris Brown who are directing their own visuals ask me to produce because I'm able to that. Right. I, I see, uh, I see Dean asking that below um, because I, I'm able to wear both hats. So I'm able to kind of like look, you know, watch over them from a director standpoint as well. So shout out to all the PMs and coordinators who work for me because <laughs> a lot of the typical producing stuff gets handed to them because I want to, you know, I try and just uh, only produce when it's really a creative producer these days. Dean also said, what's the most frustrating thing for a director? The most frustrating thing for a director? Yeah. Um, are we talking about music videos or like just in general being a director? Yeah, I feel like that answer is, the answer to that is definitely different versus if you're talking about yeah. a music video <laughs> I guess I guess we'll just say music videos. I think uh, sometimes it's frustrating when when there's not a lot of communication from the artist or label on what they want. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, they get on set and they like, why aren't things this way? And it's like, well, nobody ever communicated that to me before the day. So a lot of times in music videos, for whatever reasons, you find yourself guessing. Um, and that's challenging sometimes because, you know, you have to think about the video that you're working on and the song that day. But also that song, that track is probably part of an album. That album has probably its own visual feel. So you got to kind of wear two hats in a sense of like, where you're, you're, you have to think about what's best for this video and this concept and the artist in this moment. But sometimes that could tie into a bigger picture that you're not aware of. And sometimes there's a miscommunication when it comes to music videos in that, in that regard. Do you ever feel that way? Uh, are you kidding me? Of course. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So my, I'm not crazy. It's, no, yeah, absolutely. It's it's like, and then, and then it gets blamed on you sometimes when it's Always. like, yeah, when it, it always like, it always comes back to the director, like you know, yeah, or, or the producer. It just comes to the territory, that's, you know. That's the but, most frustrating part for me. It's like, no, I'm literally on here on standby, like doing everything I can with like the little bit that you're get your bread. Exactly. There's yeah. Like, labels are breadcrumbers and ghosts. Yeah. They ghost yeah. the fuck out of you when they don't want you. You know what I mean? Like it's they'll so true. you. <laughs> well, like I think I feel like at the end of the day, uh, it's like it's people don't always want to take responsibility for certain decisions. So it's like if the label says, or the artist, or if somebody uh, says one thing or gives you, you know, a little nugget of info and you run with that, and then it doesn't turn out great. They don't want to feel like that responsibility is on them. So sometimes I'll almost hold back um, on giving you direction because they don't really want to be the ones who gave the wrong direction. And that's sometimes a problem. I have a question, actually, because um, I feel like you have personal relationships with a lot of the artists you work with, right? Yeah, for sure. So um, have you ever felt like labels be salty about that? Um, yeah, definitely. Sometimes, like, I know, you know, sometimes, well, I guess it's it's kind of 50-50. Like, sometimes the, the commissioners and labels like that you have a relationship with the artist because you're able to have a direct line of communication with them. Uh, on the creative that sometimes the commissioners just don't have because sometimes the, you know the artists just like don't want to deal with the label or like are hard to get a hold of or whatever reasons so sometimes they like it in that regard but also I feel like I've also experienced some uh, commissioners or labels being frustrated with that because we're kind of moving faster exactly. sometimes than the label is and they don't like to feel like they're not in control of the situation like if me and me and me and an artist come up with a, you know an amazing idea that's going to cost x amount of money which is X amount of money over what the label wants to spend, the label can be upset because now I just convinced this, told this artist that we're going to be able to do it. Exactly. And then they're pissed because now how are they going to tell the artist that we can't do what the idea that we just came up with on our own? Right. So it's, it's tough, but I mean, you, you gotta, you know, sometimes, I mean, for me, like the best videos that come, come about when you have that direct line with the artist and you collaborate on a concept together, you know, yeah. I don't know if I've ever actually booked a video that I just wrote on randomly, to be honest, you know, like just a solicitation. I don't think so. It's always been like a combination of like, I got the, I got the, the track from the label, but like, I also knew the artist and was able to work that angle too, um, or as a single bid from the artist. But I don't think it's ever just been like a random track sent my way and they just picked my treatment out of like a stack, like maybe once or twice. But I feel like all my work is usually direct relationships. Like that Netflix video you wrote was a single bid, they told you, right? Yeah, told like, you. I wrote on <laughs> Yeah, that shit happens all the time. It, like that's it's politics. So it's annoying. Like it's like, just be transparent. Just tell me, hey, we really want Andrew Sandler to direct this, but if we can't yeah. get Sandler, we absolutely hate his idea. 
maybe we'll go with you. But, you know? but they'll never, but they'll, 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 like, they'll never tell you that because they want to keep their options open, you know? Right. Like dating. They'll tell you they'll, they're single bidding you because they want to make you feel special enough to write on exactly. it. Exactly. Don't waste your time. Exactly. And they'll tell, turn around and tell you the same thing. Oh, yeah, that's happened before. Oh, actually. oh yeah. Whole I've time. been told I was single bid with someone else being single bid. And like, we're both like going head to head, you know, all the time. Um, how do you guys find the right talent? Or what are the key points you look at talent when you hire those people? For what? I don't understand this question. What are the key points you look at talent? Um, I think personality, honestly, is has a lot to do with talent. In terms of like uh, the persona that you're trying to convey in like an extra, do you know what I'm saying? Like, for example, the, the woman I had in in and out with the eyes. Yeah, she was dope. Like, she was, you know, she, she was gonna be the grandmother in the beginning of the video. And I was like, who's sending me Medea? Like, I want a real, <laughs> I want a real grandmother. Yeah, yeah. And then it was like a light bulb, like the night before the video, I'm like, who's gonna be my cashier? And then I was like, oh, that comedian woman, you know? So dope, and yeah. Like, and she was able to do that thing with her eyes. I was like, the universe just, like, I could have never found someone that perfect. You know what I mean? Like, no. came through. Yeah. So, yeah. Like, I think that's the same thing with your friend Caroline. Like, you always know yeah. her. Yeah. Like, she, her personality always, her persona works yeah. for whatever you're casting her for, right? Yeah. I mean, there's been so many times on set where, just like you said, you know, somebody that you casted for a role, a role uh, shows up, and then you decide in real time that, the energy isn't right, the personality is not right compared to what you thought. And then maybe somebody else you cast it for another role has a better vibe for it, or you come up with a light bulb on the set and you just swap them out. I mean, there's been, there has been times where I've literally called the casting director and I'm like, she's not right. We're shooting that shot at, you know, 3 p.m. You know, who else can you send here? And you just have to be real about that because those decisions can make or break a video. Like you can't be, you know, you can't always just, you know, be super nice and, and be afraid to, you can't be afraid to like upset people sometimes. 100%. Um, okay, how do you feel about the direct, oh, no, not the direct, about the shot list? How do I feel about the shot list? Yeah, how important is a shot list to you? Um, I feel like it's always important to have, have some sort of shot list going into a job. You know, sometimes the, sometimes the details of that shot list changes uh, based on the needs of the job. So I'm sorry, my battery is low. Um, sometimes it'll be a super in-depth in shot list just because I know the the demands of the shooter are going to be pretty crazy and then sometimes it's just a simple blueprint of like a more of like a setups list than it is a shot list you know oh. like for me a setups list is the bare minimum like knowing what your setup is and then for me it's like you can play within those setups you know with your dp on on the day it's not so much about the specific shots um but you should always go with the best case scenario and there's been times where literally that paper gets torn up at the beginning of the day and you start from scratch, depending on, you know, the artist gets there and has a whole new idea or like you have to pivot because like on, on this job I did last month, I showed up to set and there was no light. Like our first setup was supposed to be the biggest pre-light. So the, uh, the uh, uh, sorry, the grip and lighting team was supposed to have an hour pre-call to set up the this first huge setup. And I get to set at crew call, which is and nobody's there. The grip driver filled up the truck with 87 fuel. So like the first setup of the day, which is supposed to be the biggest setup, and like all the lights were still in Burbank and we were shooting at Studio 60 near downtown LA. So literally they're like shuttling lights over from Burbank, like one at a time basically. And we had to completely scrap the setup that we planned for and just come up with a new setup based on what was available to us, which was like four lights and like, a couple of pieces of grip gear but it's like this stuff happens all the time so it's right. like you just you have get the best you have a best case yeah you have a best case scenario but you get you can't be you have to be ready for that to go out the window too right that's why we're excited for film yeah oh yeah <laughs> i mean when it comes when it comes to film though it's a whole different I, I was just explaining music videos like when it comes to to film like narr like real narrative film i absolutely have have a shot list like that should have storyboarded out in my head like to a t and, you know, you maneuver around that, you know, that shot list based on things that you see on set, you know, like amazing moments happen all the time. And you want to be able to pivot to capture those moments the best way you can to tell the story. But for narrative, it's so important. You have a shot list always. Right. 
what about building your team? You said you were excited to work on projects where you pick who you work with. What's the best way to build these relationships and get in the door with bigger projects? Um, so I, I would say like 90% of the time I work with, with the same people, but the occasional project comes around where like, I really like a specific uh, DP that I haven't worked with before. I love his specific style for this project. So I always try and like, I find a balance between surrounding myself with people I've worked with over the past eight years of my career who have come up with me. And like, I want to keep, you want to keep growing and elevating with the team around you that you work well with. But occasionally you also want to try and work with somebody who may be out of your league because that's how you can grow and learn. And I think it's okay. You know, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's, it's okay to step out of your usual team of people and work with someone new. If that someone new is, is someone that you look up to or that you love their style for a certain reason that can kind of like elevate your, your look, because if, you know, one person elevates, so does everybody around you. So how much, cause I know there's like some directors like love switching out their DPs all the time. Mm. Um, how often are you your DP? Um, it's, uh, I mean, I have like, I would say like, there's maybe four or five DPs that I rotate between yeah. and then, and then, and then like occasionally I'll just go completely left field and, and work with somebody who maybe I saw something they did last week or somebody I've always wanted to work with, um, and throw them into the mix for a certain project. Cause it has a, a specific look I'm going for. Um, so it really just depends on the project. At the end of the day, you got to do what's best for the project. And it's really important to find that balance between, um, you know, feeding, feeding your team, but also not, not being too precious about working with new people. Right. So is there anyone you haven't worked with in the music video sphere that you'd like to work with? As far as like a DP or like talent or? Uh, both, I guess, uh, crew and uh, um, an artist. Um, I mean, I love working with, with Maz Makani a lot, but you know, I can't always afford him or Joe Labisi are my two favorite DPs right now in the music video circuit, but there's a lot of up and coming people that, uh, I love to work with. And I'm always, that's something I always look for when I'm scrolling through Instagram or like a new video comes out. I'm always looking at who the team was behind the projects. And I'm always taking a mental note of, um, you know, keeping a roster of like people that, um, I want to work with. Um, and then as far as like music artists, like the top of my list right now is I want to work with the weekend. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. He's so dope. I love, I love his visuals. Um, a, so yeah, that's the top. What'd you say? Did you say someone else after he's, that? No, I'm saying he's at the top of my list. For sure. For sure. 100%. What about you? Who's your, who's your dream artist to work with? Um, the weekend's on my list, but bad bunny is definitely my, uh, <laughs> dope. My number one. Um, but yeah. You just did a video recently with a, a DP I work with a lot. What's the name of that video? It was so sick. They shot on film. Russ Fraser shot it, who's a DP that I always love working with um, when I shoot on film. Let's see. It was like a floating, like um, this like floating thing in the water, like on the yeah. beach. It was like a see-through like box. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was, I thought I that was sick. Film. Was that yeah? Was that in Puerto Rico, or they shot that here? I think Puerto Rico. Yeah, yeah, I thought so. Yeah, too. they shot that on film. Um, yeah, I love shooting on film whenever, whenever I can afford it. But there's, there's also limitations to it. I'm not one of those people who's like it's all about film. Like I love digital because there's so much flexibility with shooting on Alexa and Red that you don't have with film. What's your biggest project that you've shot on film? Um, I don't know about biggest. I recently shot a Sublime video on 16 mil. But that's and now with with Russ. Uh, no, it hasn't come out yet. Um, I saw that with Russ Fraser, actually, who shot this Bad Bunny video. So, so he's he's on my list yeah. of DPs. I he's have great. Check out his stuff. Well, I got to plug my phone in real quick. Okay. Well, we passed the hour, anyways. Um, who's your favorite video director? Um, Anthony Mandler and Dave Myers. Oh yeah, I th yeah. They have two different styles, but <laughs> I love them Myers. both equally. What's that? Okay. Oh, they have two completely different styles, but I, I, they're both my top top music video directors. I mean, Dave, Dave's a legend. He's done some, obviously, like some of our, some of the, you know, most famous OG videos in the game. And then have Anthony you, Mandler, what's that? Have you met him, Dave Myers? No, I haven't met Dave. I wouldn't be no. surprised. I will, though. Yeah. <laughs> I know, right? I will, I'm aware. <laughs> yeah. He's, he's going to get up in a clubhouse room one of these days. I know, right? <laughs> no. That'd be sick. He doesn't he doesn't seem like the type. Yeah. Well, anyways, 
thank you for well, this conversation. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Um, it was fun. Been on. Excited to continue on the on the Sandler journey. Yeah, thank you. And I love I love seeing your journey and all the work you put out. And I love your uh, unique style and your personality. And I love how you infuse that into your work. And just know that uh, it doesn't go unnoticed. And your work is so special. And oh, I love I love watching your career. No, it really is. Um, I love seeing how far you've come and just yeah, keep killing it. Oh my god, thank you. Yes, this year yeah. we're gonna do some magic together. Hell yeah, let's do it. I'm gonna okay. call Jesse tomorrow and be like, yo. Exactly. I'm going, me and Roxanne, let's go. Let's go, exactly. All okay. right. Love. Love. Thank you. Bye. Bye.